Please welcome Jennifer Chiaverini. Well, thank you all so much for coming out to see me on this beautiful Saturday evening. I don't know why you're not out on the water, on your boats, enjoying the... Okay, it's a little cold and rainy, but we're here and we're going we're to talk about books and history and all kinds of wonderful things. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my new book and I'll do a little reading and then I'll have a Q&A. So uh, any burning questions that you've been longing to ask about this book or any of the previous books, I'd be happy to take a stab at them for you. Um, I want to thank everyone from the Central Wisconsin Book Festival for in, uh, inviting me to be here with you. It is such a pleasure. I, I really love libraries. My first real job was as a page at the Thousand Oaks City Library in Southern California where I was living. And I've always just been a wonderful, very enthusiastic library user and library supporter. So I'm especially pleased to be here sponsored by the library. And I also want to thank my husband, Marty, the handsome gentleman over there who just gave you a little wave. He's my entourage for the evening. He, he drove me up here so that I could like, take a little rest in the car and, and get ready to, to talk to all of you. So yes, as you just heard, uh, I have written 32 novels. I've written 40 books overall, and Switchboard Soldiers is the 32nd. It is uh, another one of my standalone historical novels. And like so many of my novels, I came up with the idea for this book while I was researching a previous novel. While I was researching the Women's March, which came out last summer, I had to do a lot of um, research into uh, the, the whole suffragette movement, the whole suffrage, women's suffrage movement here in the US in the early 20th century. And that meant you know, reading a lot about you know, how it progressed and maybe who were some of the opponents. And one of the opponents who ends up being something of a villain in the Women's March was uh, the president himself, President Woodrow Wilson, although the most, for most of the novel he's still president-elect. And while I was researching and, and learning about you know, what was going on and what was happening with the movement, I was reading a secondary source, a historian noted, and it was almost as an aside, that Woodrow Wilson was so impressed by the way that American women had conducted themselves during the Great War, that he completely changed his mind, whereas before he had been a very staunch opponent of women's suffrage. He didn't even like women speaking in public on, on political issues. He wrote to one person, that uh, one friend, that it gave him a chilled feeling when a woman spoke on issues in public like that. He just, ooh. Um, and it, but somehow, American women's behavior and the way they had conducted themselves impressed him so much that he not only changed his mind and decided that they earned the right and they deserved the right to vote, but he actually became an advocate for an amendment to the Constitution that would grant women the right to vote. Now, this wasn't something he could do by executive order, and it wasn't something he could do by voting, but he could use his position of great influence to convince other people and to speak out on the issue, and that is what he did. And when I read this, I was like, are we talking about the same Woodrow Wilson, that one who, you know, the whole chilled feeling guy? And I thought, well, if he someone who was so strongly opposed to women's suffrage, could change his mind so completely. What was it that women had done that so impressed him? Now, I knew that women had served in the Red Cross, they had served as nurses, and I know that some had served as ambulance drivers in World War I, but I thought, well, you know, we have this idea of Rosie the Riveter. We have that iconic image from World War II. And I wondered, well, isn't it likely that apparently women were also very involved in World War I? And I thought, well, I've got to find out. What was it that so impressed him that he changed his mind? And a generation before Rosie the Riveter, were women already stepping up and getting involved? Were they 
when so many of them couldn't even vote, it really depended upon what state you lived in, whether you had to write the right to vote. Because some states were granting suffrage to women, but there were some states where it was absolutely clear that was never going to happen. So your rights pretty much depended upon what state you lived in. So at a time where, depending upon where you lived, a woman might not be allowed to vote, women were stepping up to fight to preserve a democracy. They weren't even allowed to participate in fully. So I thought, well, this, this definitely bears some investigation. So I kind of filed that idea away, and I finished writing the Women's March. And then my curiosity was still very intense. So I thought, okay, now I gotta find out. If it could impress Woodrow Wilson, it must have been pretty important. So I started delving into my research, and it did not take long at all to learn that, yes, even in, in, in the Great War, in World War I, women were already stepping up. Before Rosie the Riveter in World War I, women were filling in all these workplaces that they had traditionally been excluded from. They were working in the factories. They were uh, working as postal carriers. They were streetcar drivers and conductors. And a great many of them went overseas. Some, again, were nurses. There were many volunteers with the Salvation Army. They went over and they set up huts where it offered the soldiers a place to go and relax and have some reading material and material to write letters home. And they were served hot chocolate and donuts, just something to give them a sense of, a sense of home and a sense of a comfort so far away from home. And when I read about all these different women and all of, their, all of the work that they did, what most compelled me, although of course I was impressed by all of them, was the story of the women who served as telephone operators with the US Army Signal Corps, and they served in France. And later on, they would serve in Germany, and they would serve, serve elsewhere um, as the war progressed and peace was coming. So, I think if we think back to you know, maybe some of the World War II movies we've seen and maybe news footage, we have this idea of all these military commands and all the communications being done by radio. With World War I, it was quite a different thing. Radio had already been invented, so it did exist, but the golden age of radio didn't even come about until the 1920s. So radio was not a, 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 a viable, piece of technology for communicating in the war zone. So at this point, from, you know, from the start of the war in 1914 until the U.S. became involved in 1917, the means of communications were primarily telephone. Orders from headquarters to the front, between different outposts, between um, services supply bases in the rear to the, to the front, they were primarily done by telephone. Now, sometimes runners were involved. You had actual humans carrying a message. And sometimes you even had homing pigeons carrying messages. But predominantly, the system was the telephone. So when the United States got involved in 1917, General Pershing, who was in charge of the American Expeditionary Force, headed overseas. He headed to Paris to begin setting up the infrastructure and meeting with his counterparts in the British and French and Belgian armies to try to see, you know, to try to get ready to be able to conduct his business, the business of war. In the meantime, back in the United States, our regular army was getting ready and, you know, new troops were getting recruited. So General Pershing went over, and one of the, pretty early on, one of the first things he realized was that the communication system was very hopelessly inadequate. Um, at that time, the United States had the best telephone technology anywhere in the world, and also the best and most efficient telephone operators. When he got to France, he was kind of expecting the same level of service that he had had back home, and he quickly realized that that was not the case. For one, case, for, for one, uh, one factor was that France had already been go going through years of war. The infrastructure was very damaged. It was impossible to get supplies a lot of the time. And even then, what was working, the technology tended to be fairly antique by American standards. So the, one of the first things he said was, 
I need to have American technology shipped over from the states, and I need it installed now. Now, AT&T and other companies, but a lot of the action focuses on AT&T, but also Pacific Bell, they, even before the U.S. got into the war, they knew, they could see which way things were going. So they had already begun establishing reserve units uh, for the Signal Corps of linesmen and other technical men, who they were all men at this point, who could go, when, as soon as they would be called, they would be ready to go over there and start doing the work that needed to be done. And it's a very good thing they had that foresight because one of the first things General Pershing did was said was get our equipment over here. So immediately those reserve units became active units and they came over to France and they started installing those big switchboards. I'm sure you've seen them, and if only in photos or old movies, where you have this big wall and you have all these blinking lights and all these jacks and then you have women, because in the US they were almost all women, not entirely, but you know, almost all women, sitting at these high stools with their headsets on and their mouthpieces on, like a lot of us were doing on Zoom almost for, for many, many months. You know, so you can relate, maybe, except you're on your own at home as opposed to a workplace. And then a light would flash, and then the operator in charge of it would stick one end of a cable in it, and it would ask for the number, and they would get the number, and then they would, you know, if you're lucky, it's within arm's reach. Sometimes you have to stretch in front of your neighbor and plug it over there. And you listen in just for a little while to make sure the parties are connected. You don't stick around and listen to the conversation. And then you withdraw from the call. And then by that time, another light has gone on. So you've probably seen these elaborate systems. So these switchboard exchanges were getting set up in France and various outposts where they needed them. And then they decided, OK, now we need people to run them. So they tried to train, well, they did train um, men, and I was going to say male soldiers, but that's redundant with the US Army at this point. Not so the Navy. The Navy was ahead of the Army at this point. They had already begun recruiting and enlisting women to serve in office positions, clerical positions, and other, you know, other jobs of that sort to free up men to go to sea, to go to war. Army wasn't quite ready to do that at this point. So the option was to train men, male soldiers, to work these switchboards. And so they started with telegraph operators from the Signal Corps because it seemed like comparable skills. So once they got the men ready and got them trained, they were all in front of their switchboards, they could connect a call in about a minute. And that sounds pretty good. Not to you. I heard someone in the front going, no, whoa. And you're not even going by cell phone standards. You're just going by regular telephone standards. So it would take the men who were trained, and granted, OK, they weren't very experienced, it would take them about a minute to connect a call. And it sounds pretty good to everyone but the lady up at front. And you, have, you must have some insider information. You're, yeah, you know something about it. So um, that sounds good until you think that Back in the States, the well-trained, experienced telephone operators could connect a call in 10 seconds. And when you're thinking about all the information that they would be communicating, military orders, orders to attack, orders to withdraw, send up reinforcements, you know, supplies need to be here immediately, you know, military intelligence, all of that, that 50 seconds makes the difference between a battle won, a battle lost, lives saved, lives lost. And you can understand why General Pershing was not willing to sacrifice 50 seconds of call. So he told the US Army, I need the best telephone operators you can get. I'm paraphrasing for the general. I need the best telephone operators you can get, and then I need them here now. The problem was, the Army wouldn't, wouldn't allow women to enlist, but the best telephone operators were women. Back in the States, this was considered a woman's job. It was, you know, a high pressure. You needed very good di diplomatic skills. You needed to be able to communicate well and have good hand-eye coordination, all things that it was, you know, and they're going by stereotypes here, we'll grant you that, 
women were considered especially useful for, especially suited for. Also, women, they believed, were better suited than men to deal with irate phone callers. If someone called up angry because, you know, they gave you the wrong number and you can't connect the call because they gave you the wrong number and they hurl abuse at the telephone operator, well, a man is more likely to say, well, why, Lada, you wise guy, and hang up on him. Not so a lady who is used to being... And now you're spotting the problem I had when I was reading. Oh, women are better suited to deal with angry customers than men. And my thought is, well, maybe the customers need to work on their people skills a little bit, and not we have to hire people who have fewer options for their careers and are more willing to put up with abuse. But you know, that's me looking back from the 21st century and you know, looking, you know, we're looking at an early 20th century perspective. And in some ways, we've come a long way. And in some ways, we still tend to be unkind to customer service people. So maybe we all still need to work on that. But at any rate, that's one of the reasons why this was considered a good job for a girl, because they will be more polite, even when someone is being mean. So he tell, General Pershing tells the Army, I need the best operators you can get me. And all the best operators are women. And women aren't allowed in the Army. And what does the U.S. Army Signal Corps do? They start recruiting women. They have to. The general said so, and they all want to win this war. So there were a few criteria that they needed to meet before someone would be allowed to be a part of this program, to join the Signal Corps as switchboard soldiers, as telephone operators. And the first one was, of course, they had to be very, very good at their job. Um, you couldn't, you know, errors were not acceptable. Accuracy and speed were absolutely crucial. So they had to be very good at their job. Secondly, they had to be absolutely loyal and very, very smart because they would be dealing with highly classified information. They had to not only be so loyal to the U.S. and the Allies that they wouldn't intentionally give anything away to the enemy, but they also had to be clever enough that they would not be tricked into inadvertently giving away any secrets. Like if someone would come up to say, hey, I heard you guys are moving closer to the front. Is that next month? Oh, no, sir, that's next week. No, 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 no. It has to be, oh, I, uh, you know more about it than I do. This is the first I'm hearing of it, you know. Someone who won't slip up even if someone is wearing a uniform that you usually will salute. Then the third criterion, which weeded out a lot of potential applicants, was that they had to be absolutely fluent in French. I'm not talking you got an A in high school French class. Absolutely fluent. And you're, you're saying, oh, she must have got an A in, or she's fluent, one or the other. Okay. Um, maybe both. Maybe that's why you're fluent, and that's why you got A's in Spanish class. So you were a French class. So you were a ringer. Um, and part of it is because, you know, yes, they're going to be in France. It would be useful to speak French, but it was much more important than that because the operators would be handling calls between American and French officers. So an American officer would need to speak to his counterpart in the French army at some other headquarters. And the two men often did not speak each other's language. So the telephone operator not only had to co connect the call, she had to stay on the line and translate in real time on the spot between the two officers who otherwise could not understand one another. And again, the kind of information they're working with, every single word has to be right. You can't get a single adverb wrong. No, 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 not backward, I said forward. I mean, that makes a difference when you're dealing with this kind of information. So they had to be able to translate on the spot um, in a high pressure situation. So despite, oh, and the women were also told, oh, by the way, you will not need to bring your evening gowns. One advertisement actually did say that. Evening dress is not required. And they were told it was going to be a hardship job. It was going to be challenging. It was going to be dangerous. You might not come back. They didn't emphasize that 
do much, but it was very, very clear. You know, you should, you have to be physically fit and up to, up to this job or please don't apply. Despite all of these qualifications, despite the warnings, despite the very real danger, 7,600 women applied. And uh, some of them, I think, maybe just had the A in French class and weren't really fluent. Um, and uh, that was weeded down to, you know, that was screened down to, you know, smaller numbers who were summoned to regional training sites where they were trained on a variety of different switchboards because you never knew if you were going to get state of the art or if you were going to get the kind you had to hand crank, you know, and you were lucky if it worked. Um, and to see if they were physically fit, because you know, if you weren't, then the last thing you need to be doing is going over there. And then also to test them frequently in French. Um, so that was screened down and, and there were more cuts made even at these regional levels. And then out of the original 7,600, 233 were accepted into the program. And then in March of 1918, the first group of the first unit of 33 women were sent from, their, their ship set sail from Hoboken, New Jersey, and first it went to the UK, and they were in the UK for a little while, and then they sailed for France, where they were dispersed to places in Paris. There were a lot of switchboards in Paris that needed you know, a very central hub for the telephone um, communications. Some were sent to services of supply bases further to the rear, where they were responsible for a lot of you know, medical evacuation orders and also getting supplies where they needed to be. And then some were sent very close to the front at General Pershing's headquarters and at other places uh, like that. And that's where the switchboard soldiers wanted to be. I would have wanted to be back near the rear where I could do my bit without being in too much danger, but you know, that's why I'm also not fluent in French, so I wouldn't have been eligible anyway. But they all wanted to be where the action was. They knew every service was important. They knew everybody's job was valuable, but they wanted to be where the phone calls mattered the most, and that was up at headquarters with General Pershing. So, um, you know, that first group of 33 women went over, and then other groups would follow them, you know, within a few weeks. And then they were, they were all over. They were dispersed throughout. Even after peace, even after the armistice, the telephone operators remained because someone had to be running the phones for the peace conference in Paris and had to be running the phones for returning, making all of the logistical arrangements to get the soldiers back home. So someone had to stand there to stay there. So they were some of the last people out. And some of them were with the Army of Occupation in Germany as well. Um, but I will say that not all of the switchboard soldiers survived their service. Not all of them returned um, back to the state safely. But those who did came back absolutely changed for their experience. It was, so it was an adventure. It was terrifying. They formed lifelong friendships. They endured you know, hardships they would not wish on anyone. Um, and it was, it was something that changed them when they came back. And apparently it also changed the, the mind of one American president who went from being opposed to their full participation in democracy to being one of the strongest advocates. So um, I thought I would read to you a little excerpt from the book. And I have three narrators in this story. Two of them are fictional, and one of them is based, well, they're all fictional, it's a novel. Um, two of them are, uh, two of my narrators are complete works of the imagination based upon the experiences of real telephone operators. And then another, Grace Banker, is based upon a real switchboard soldier. She was the leader of, at the ripe age of 25, she was in charge of this group of 33 women, including herself, and her service overseas was so exemplary that she even won the uh, Distinguished Service Medal for her work. And, uh, you know, in her state, I don't think she was able to vote yet, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, no, the New York 
vote might have passed by then. I know the Chicago one did um, for the state ballot. So um, I thought I would read to you an excerpt from one of my fictional characters, and her name is Marie, and she is actually a, a native of France, and her family came to Cincinnati. Why Cincinnati? Because I was born there, and I wanted to write about Cincinnati. And uh, her family is all very musical, and they came to Cincinnati because her parents, uh, there are three daughters in the family, Marie is the eldest, the parents, uh, I have received um, visiting professor assist, uh, positions with the conservatory there, which is now part of the University of Cincinnati. Why is that important? Because that's where my mom graduated from college. And um, Marie is an aspiring opera singer. Why? Because my son is a voice and opera major at UW-Madison right now. So, you know, people say, do you write, you know, which, which character is based upon you? None of my characters are based upon me, but I do bring in these little details now and then. So Marie is an aspiring opera singer as well. And, um, you know, her family came over to work for a couple of years, but then the war intervened and it wasn't safe for them, it wasn't even, there, the, where, the place where they lived was occupied or being shelled, so it wasn't safe for them to go back. So they're in Cincinnati for a while. Marie has been auditioning to get into opera companies, not a lot to choose from in the US at that time. So she's auditioning for this symphony chorus and, and, and that here and there, and she's not having much luck. So because she wants to help pay her own way, she has gotten a job as a telephone operator in, in Cincinnati. And she is, and why did I pick this particular exchange? Because it's my grandparents' neighborhood. So Hartwell, that's where my grandparents lived. Um, among other places, that's where they lived. So all these autobiographical details I brought in. Um, so she, in this piece, she is just about to get to work. Um, she has had a, an audition down in Over the Rhine at this wonderful theater they have there. And the, um, you know, it, it's run a little bit late. I won't spoil it, I'll let you find out. It is related to the war, why, it, why her audition has run late. So she, you know, she was all glammed up for her audition in a beautiful gown with her hair and this beautiful coiffure. And so you know, she, her audition is finally over and she thinks she did well, but now she's gotta get out of the gown and put in something more appropriate for work. You gotta leave the coiffure up there though. You can't start pulling out pins or it'll all come crashing down. So now she's gotten on the bus, and there was an issue on the bus, and so, okay, so finally, she is running into work, but she's, oh, she's already late, and that is just not good. She was a full quarter hour late by the time she arrived at the Valley Exchange in Hartwell, one of the newer buildings, constructed a few years before to accommodate increased telephone service in the growing northern neighborhoods. Swiftly, but without drawing undue attention, Marie passed the administrative offices, left her things in the operator's lounge, and hurried off to punch her time card, only to discover that it was not in the slot where she had left it. A quick search confirmed that a thoughtful friend had punched it for her a minute before she would have been due at the switchboard. If Marie could reach her station unnoticed, her supervisor would be none the wiser. For the first time all day, luck was on her side. You are an angel, she murmured to her friend Ethel as she took her place in the next seat over, donned her headset, and adjusted the mouthpiece. mouthpiece. You would have done the same for me, said Ethel, pulling the plug on a finished call and doing a double take at the sight of Marie's elegant coiffure. My goodness, look at you, and all for an ordinary afternoon shift. You French girls sure have style. I must do my part to keep up our international reputation, Marie replied, responding to a blinking light by swiftly inserting a plug in the proper jack. Number, please. A half hour passed before she and Ethel were able to talk again. I was right about the phone service over there, Ethel said in an undertone. Didn't I say weeks ago that something was in the works with the army? In the works, Marie echoed, puzzled. Every operator knew that when General Pershing had arrived in France back in June, he had been dismayed by the state of telephone service there. The outdated equipment, the failing switchboards, the scarcity of intact wires and poles, and the limited number of telephone operators. 
Apparently, the Army had tried to train soldiers, former telegraph operators, to run the switchboards, but the men were said to be slow, inefficient, and inaccurate, frustrating the officers who expected the same swift, flawless service they enjoyed back at the States. But that was old news, hardly worth the eager sparkle in Ethel's eyes. Do you mean our reserve signal corps boys sailing for France? No, not that. The poster. Didn't you see the poster hanging in the lounge? Marie shook her head. I was in such a hurry that I only had time to... A light blinked. She snatched up a cable and inserted the plug. Number, please. After that, the calls came in so steadily that there was never a lull long enough for Marie to ask Ethel to explain. What was Ethel referring to, if not the work of the Reserve Signal Corps? As far back as January, even before the United States had joined the war, executives at the highest levels of American Telephone and Telegraph, their parent company, had forged a partnership with the U.S. Army to organize their skilled technical workers into reserve battalions that would be prepared to go to war as soon as they were needed. Their foresight proved invaluable, for General Pershing had no sooner discovered the antiquated state of the telephone system he was obliged to lease from the French than he realized he must construct an entirely new system using superior American technology, a wire network running hundreds of miles through France, connecting headquarters to essential outposts and bases. Earlier that fall, two American Expeditionary Forces battalions had begun construction, raising poles to hang lines in some locations, resorting to tree branches or fence posts where poles were impractical or unavailable, or running wires through dedicated trenches closer to the front. It was extremely hazardous work, leaving linemen dangerously exposed to sniper fire while working atop the poles and trees, or requiring them to crawl out into no man's land to repair lines cut by the enemy. It was not until she and Ethel left the switchboards for their dinner break that Marie was able to ask her friend what she was talking about. The army needs us, Ethel said earnestly, linking her arm through Marie's as they set out for the operator's lounge. Or rather, they need you, because as much as I'd love to apply, I lack one essential qualification. Qualification for what, Marie asked. In reply, Ethel led Marie to a small, plain poster hanging near the door to the cloakroom, understated black type on white paper with no illustration. Army wants women to serve as switchboard soldiers, Marie read the headline aloud. Astonished, she paused and turned to Ethel, who grinned and gestured for her to continue reading. The U.S. Army was urgently recruiting qualified women telephone operators fluent in French to serve in the Signal Corps as part of the American Expeditionary Forces in France. For this essential overseas war work, the Signal Corps sought level-headed young women who were resourceful, who were able to exercise good judgment in emergencies, and were willing to work hard and endure hazardous conditions if necessary. Applicants who passed the initial screening would be required to undergo extensive training and to pass examinations in French and telephone operations to qualify as signal core telephone operators. These switchboard soldiers would enjoy the same status and privileges as nurses, would be required to wear standard uniforms as specified by the War College, and in every respect would be considered as soldiers coming under military restrictions at all times. Doesn't it sound exciting, Ethel sighed, wistful. Unfortunately, I don't qualify. Marie's gaze was fixed on the poster. Because you don't exercise good judgment? <laughs> Ethel nudged her. No, silly, because I don't speak French. But you do. Yes, I do. Marie read the poster over again more carefully, noting the requirements, the application procedures, the pay, the warnings, the appeals to pride and patriotism. She had the exact skills they urgently needed. She was precisely what they were looking for. And it was the first time through the long, disappointing months of auditions she had been able to say that. Her heart ached whenever she thought of the terror and suffering the Germans were inflicting upon her beloved France. The war was already beginning to change her adopted city into a grimmer, crueler version of itself, 
as fear, suspicion, and anger turn neighbors against one another. Now fate had presented her with the means to make a difference, to help the Allies win the war, to speed the end of the horrific violence and destruction, to restore peace to the world. How could she ignore the call? So that's how one telephone operator, albeit fictional in this case, learned about this opportunity and this urgent need and how she decided to go if she could convince her parents. They still were required to get their parents' permission before they were allowed to do anything like this, or their husband's permission if they were married. But in Marie's case, she had to convince her mom and dad to let her go back to France to do something very important but also very dangerous. So. Well, that's all I was planning to read to you from the book tonight, because I'm hoping just to, to engage your imagination so much that you'll want to rush back and, and get your own copy. Um, but I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any about this book or about uh, any of the previous books or anything within my limited frame. Yes? Yes, in the U.S., yes, over there, usually with capital O, capital T. Yeah, and there was a very popular song, over there, over there, you know, it's referring to that. And, you know, I, they, they didn't use that phrase in Britain, so my understanding is that's an American, American thing, and it is certainly, you know, pretty far over, but that's, but I, I believe the song popularized it. I could be wrong, that's not something I specifically researched. Um, it could have been the song came first, and then that's, it got picked up that way. But that's another interesting research question. I'll probably Google it as soon as I get out of here. I'm like, oh no, I gave her the wrong information. So let me add, I think, you know, I'm not sure which direction it went, but yes, they did refer to it often as over there, you know. And then of course, once they were over there, they had to be very vague in their letters home to pass the censors. They weren't allowed to say where over there they were. They could say, oh, I'm somewhere in France, and that was pretty much it. Anything else would get, you know, redacted. Um, so, yeah, you couldn't, and, uh, and you could get in trouble if you tried to use little clues or hints, you know, to, to try to get the message to your parents, like, oh, remember where Aunt Tilly spent her honeymoon? I'm not anywhere near there, really. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, the censors are like, mm, no, and they get out that Sharpie, although it probably wasn't a Sharpie. I don't, th I don't think the sharp. Another research question. Were they using sharp? No, they weren't using sharp. So yes, once they were over there, they could say, somewhere in France, you know, and that was pretty much it. Yes? How long did it take you to do the research? How long did it take me to do the research? Well, I, I, it, I don't ever actually keep track of the time that way, but I will say that from the time I first decide, okay, this is the next book I'm going to be, begin today, it's usually about two years between that day and the time you see it uh, on your bookstore shelves or on your library shelves. But there's overlap with different projects, because I know you're thinking, wait a minute, you've got 32 novels out since 1999, you know. Um, how is that two every two years? Well, it's in different stages. So, for example, like right now, I'm out talking to you lovely people about my most recent release. I also have a book that will be coming out next year that is already in the production process. So that's at my publisher. They're working on cover designs and marketing copy and trying to convince bookstores and libraries to carry it. And they're doing all of their things, all their stuff, page design, all of the complicated stuff that they handle. In the meanwhile, I'm writing the first draft of book number three. So that's how I'm able to do a book a year because different things are in different stages. Um, I could not write the first draft or research two different novels at the same time. Um, somebody more able than I am who can compartmentalize could probably do that beautifully. But for me, I can only really focus on the first draft and the research of one book at a time because I'm in that world when I'm creating it. I can go back and correct it, you know, edit, edit a manuscript, um, but not, not two first drafts at the same time. Um, as for the research, what I usually do, and I don't, again, I don't keep track of it because it takes as long as it takes, depending upon the book. But I usually begin by doing a lot of background general reading, 
so that I can get a good sense of the era, the people involved, um, the places that are involved. And that's really where I discover the story. I learned which historical figures would be great to adapt into fictional characters. What historical events should I definitely include? What places will my characters be spending a lot of time in? So I need to do a lot more research into what did they look like and what were they like back then? And, and that sort of thing. So after doing the general reading, then I focus more narrowly on those specific topics. And that means more reading and more research, sometimes travel. And then while I'm doing that, I'm taking notes and I'm making a timeline so that from all of these different sources, some of them repeat the same information, but a lot of them don't. So I can draw them all together and have a, have a chronology, you know, so that I can see when important things are happening. And then after that, I decide who my characters are going to be. And working from my timeline, I try to see where various logical chapter breaks fall. You know, what ideas seem to make sense together, what maybe belong in a separate unit of their own. And from that, I construct an outline. But it's not the kind of formal outline that we learned in school. I use, you know, the Roman numerals and the capital letters. I do that when I'm writing nonfiction. Um, unless it's a very short essay, but like a pattern book or something like that, then yeah, then I work with that kind of outline. But my outline for a novel is really just, okay, chapter one, it will cover this time frame, this is the narrator I'll use, and then I either make a list, but more often a paragraph, describing what needs to go in that chapter, what historical events, what narrative plot points should happen, what character development should happen. And then I continue working on until I have the outline done. And then once I have that done, then I go back and I start writing beginning with chapter one or that prologue or whatever it happens to be. Um, and then invariably when I'm writing, the outline will have to change. Either I'll just say, you know what, I really should, now nah, this character, now that I know this character better, she would never do that. I need, I should have her do this instead. And then as I'm working on the book, you know, oh, okay, I thought this would be one chapter. It really needs to be two because the ideas, you know, are really going in different directions or this would be better from this character's perspective. This person wasn't even in the room while this was happening, so let's give it to this character. And while I'm writing two, I'll discover new things that I didn't know I needed to be very well informed about, so I'll need to go back and do more research. So that's why it's very hard to answer his question specifically. How much time does it take you to do research? Two months. Next question. I can't, it doesn't work that way. Pardon me? I am not, I'm maybe over my lap, but I'm not doing it. I might be clutching it in terror or in anxiety or angst or something, but no, I'm not quilting and doing my research at the same time. I can't, oh wow, that, let's do three things. Let's research two novels and quilt at the same time and then my brain would explode and that would be the end of it, so. Um, no, so can't do that at the same time. But um, I do, while I'm writing, I will invariably come upon a topic that I didn't, I didn't realize when I was doing my timeline how important this was going to be. So then I have to go back and do more research. And that could be the matter of a couple of hours because I just need to know, know, okay, what did the buildings look like in this village? Or it might be, wait a minute, who was this guy and was he important? I better read about him to find out. So, you know, it, it's really hard to give you just a simple straight answer about how long the research takes because I do a lot of it up front, but it really does continue throughout the writing process and the revising process and the copy editing process when the copywriters say, will say something like, are you sure that's how they started up cars back in 1914? And I'll be, actually, no. I have never driven a car made in 1914. I had better find out. And then I have to do all this research. Okay, how would a silver ghost have started up? Oh, okay, with a crank. Then I better have him cranking it, you know, that kind of thing. And does it have a key? No, it has a switch. And why did they not have keys? Well, because a gentleman, the gentleman's chauffeur would never leave the car unattended. You didn't need one. Okay, well, um, I'll fit that into the book. Not that wrong book. We're talking about a different book. But you know, these things I don't know I need to know, I could end up researching all day because I need two lines of text because I want it to be as accurate as possible. Um, you know, and also when my copy editor says, 
Are you sure? I don't want to say, ah, readers won't care, because I know a lot of them really do. And so I do try to get that right, because my readers tell me, you know, they, they like feeling like they've learned something after reading my historical fiction. And, you know, I don't, you know, and then they go and they say to their kid, oh, the answer to that history homework question is this. And then it's like, no, it's not. And then your kid gets a bad grade, and then you get mad at me. And then I can just say, it's a novel. You should assume every single thing in it is made up. But I try to get the history right. And if I do take liberties, I typically will tell you in the, um, in the, in the author's note. I'll say, OK, yes, I know that the car wasn't, you know, it had the steering wheel on the other side. But you know, I just had to have them over on the right. You know, I'll tell you that kind of stuff. And then sometimes I just genuinely make mistakes. You know, and then, you know, there are mistakes in this one. I will, t there will, there are mistakes. If you buy the hardcover today, you get the one with the awesome mistakes in it. And, you know, other people will never know. And I will tell you, yes, there are three biggies. And uh, you can look for them now. <laughs> yes, you can. And the people who read the paperback, the, you know, we all like puzzles, right? We all like search things, you know, we all like that. The people who get the paperback next year, they won't get to have that fun. But you can, you can, because someone didn't Google very well. Or, or you know, more or less, it's usually someone makes an assumption. And I say someone, I mean me. Someone makes an assumption, assumption that something was the way it was back then, and it turns out it wasn't. But that's all the clues I'm going to give you. You'll probably find five. And then I'll be, if you find five, tell me. You know, and not just, oh, I didn't like what she said there, because, you, OK, well, that's dialogue, you know. You might not like it. Maybe I didn't like that she said this, but you know she would have said it. She's just that kind of person. But you know, some kind of historical fact. There are there are some mistakes in the hardcover. Yes. Yeah, but they were shooting anybody. They you know. I didn't, I didn't study the Germans. I'm sorry, I did not do, because you know, there was enough to do you know, the British and the French and the Americans. Um, I didn't study the German technology, but I would imagine they, they had their own. I, I would imagine, I mean, unless they had some secret radio system that nobody knows about you know, today to have informed the sources that I consulted. Um, you know, I would imagine they were do dealing with that as well. And then, you know, snipers, they would have taken a hit at anybody. But if you have a, a guy trying to string up wire, climbing a tree, you know, yes, that's a, a very desirable target, I would imagine. But yes, there were, you know, it was, if you could cut the, the phone wires, that was really good. But what they also could do, and what the Americans could do too, is you could tap into those wires. And that was the, the switchboard soldiers were also trained to listen for anything that sounded just not quite right. Do you hear any unusual sounds? And it could just be a bad connection. It could be that, you know, you're, you know, you're, they are, the, sometimes the people you're telephoning are under attack, and that can cause problems with the system. But yes, if you could tap into the enemy's phone lines, you could hear what they're sending back and forth. So yes, that was something that was quite desirable to do. But sometimes a problem would happen when the military would, you know, advance and, you know, it's they would advance ahead of where the signal core op people had been able to run the telephone lines. And then you couldn't call, you'd have to send a runner, you'd have to have a homing pigeon. And, you know, you couldn't send your phone linemen out ahead of time to advertise, oh, we're planning to advance here tomorrow. We're just getting the phones ready. You know, that, it doesn't work that way. Also, it would be incredibly dangerous. So yes, I, you know, while I haven't studied the German system, I would imagine it would be similar, but they wouldn't have you know, the American technology, which you know, is the best in the world, or so my sources say. Um, but, you know, yes, it would be certainly very desirable to either destroy the enemy's tech communication network or to tap into it and listen in to everything you can. So, yes. Yes? Um, you know, I don't see the issue being the basic set, and if not, um, how do you balance out, like, the sexual yeah. roles 
I, I really do value visiting. I really do value. The question was, do I visit the places that I write about? I, I really do value that. And when I have been able to do it, it has proved invaluable. When I wrote The Lost Quilter, one of my favorite books, it's one of the books in the Elm Creek Quilt series that is also a standalone historical novel. That book would not be as rich as I, I believe it is and as readers tell me they believe it is if I had not visited Charleston, if I had not visited the, um, you know, the, the preserved historical uh, sites there that are the plantations and I could see what the slave cabins looked like and I could talk to the people who worked there, talk to the docents, talk to park rangers at a lot of these wonderful historical preserved sites that are under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service. So I do think that's valuable. It's very important to me to do when I can. During the pandemic, that was absolutely not an option for me. I limited myself to Wisconsin, Minnesota, because my son was going to school there, and Michigan, because I fully believe that the, the Upper Peninsula should belong to Wisconsin, because it's attached to us. I really think it should be. I understand, you know, they had to. I understand. I know I'm not saying we should take it back. I understand. I agree to the rules that were laid down, but I look at a map and I think it looks Wisconsin-y to me. But that's my own personal thing. You know, that's just my personal issue. I understand why they did it that way. I grew up in Michigan. I spent my whole childhood in Michigan. So if I had never moved to Wisconsin, I would probably feel differently. Um, but either way, I, I'm fine with the lines as they are drawn now. But, uh, you know, I, I could not go to France in 2020 to research this book. It was just not going to happen, not for me. Um, in uh, 2021, um, you know, I couldn't go to France to research this book either. <laughs> and I couldn't go to the UK to research the book that's coming out next year for um, uh, the, the book that my first book that I couldn't go specifically to travel for because of the pandemic was the Women's March. But that story is set primarily in Chicago, where I went to graduate school. And I, you know, I live in Madison. We visit Chicago a lot. It's, you know, we love the museums. You know, it's great. I like Chicago. Go see shows, you know. Um, and then another place where it was set was, let's see, we had then what do we have? What else do we have? Oh, we had Philadelphia, where I visited quite a lot, New York City, and then Washington, D.C., which were all places that I had visited extensively, especially D.C., but of course I was focusing on a different era, you know, with the various books, Mrs. Lincoln, the various Mrs. Lincoln's books. Um, so fortunately for that book, although it would have been nice to travel for those stories, I didn't need to because I had visited them fairly recently. So I got away with it for the Women's March. Um, for the book I'm writing now, it's entirely fictional, created my own brain, so no travel necessary. Um, but yeah, I, I do value that. Um, you know, with, uh, with the spy mistress, I learned so much by visiting Richmond, Virginia and talking to the National Park Rangers at these different preserved sites. Um, so I, I do value that very much uh, as a research, as part of the research, but you know, over the past few years, it just has not been an option, unfortunately. So not for me anyway. You saw, I walked in, you know, I'm with a mask, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm careful, I'm cautious. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. It was at a different venue, though, it, wasn't it? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's really going back. <laughs> you know, Marty and I were talking. We said, "I know I've been to Wausau before." <laughs> and, you know, yeah, and that's what it was. Yes. Yeah, well, for readers who want to, to delve into, I, I have them all in my author's note or my, my acknowledgement pages. So all of my sources are listed there. Um, you know, again, because travel was not an option, I didn't go anywhere and physically touch someone's letter. So a lot of it was, um, you know, things that had been written in secondary sources. 
But uh, one thing that was really fun to read and something I really enjoyed doing, I really like primary sources when I can get them. A lot of these women would write articles about their experiences and then they were published in magazines. And so, you know, through the wonders of libraries who digitize stuff, and you, know, you can get this kind of stuff online, I was able to read the articles that they wrote, their first person accounts of this is what my experience was like. And they were, you know, they're usually very lighthearted and fun. Another source that was wonderful for this book, and again, I looked at it in the digitized version, uh, were the industry publications from places like Pacific Bell and AT&T. They would have their own magazines where, you know, it would be, you know, innovations in the industry, things going on in particular branches. And then there were always, you know, letters from our boys overseas. And then it became letters from our girls overseas. So, and also, also knowing about the buildup, like with the Reserve Corps. Um, so even before they knew they were going to be recruiting women, those publications were invaluable because I could really see what the telephone industry was, was sharing, what information they were sharing uh, with their employees, and what soldiers and you know, male and female alike were writing back home and were being printed in these publications. And you know, the, these kind of magazines are available through Google Books um, too. You can just, for free, that's where I read most of them. Just, and it meant a lot of looking through. And, but it was great because sometimes they'd run photos too. So I could say, oh, that's what she looks like. And oh, that's what they're wearing. And um, so, yeah, those kind of primary sources are, are really just, they just, I just, I love reading those. And then newspapers too, digitized newspapers are pretty, pretty fantastic too for, for finding out, you know, what the folks back home were learning, um, you know, especially when they were preparing to go overseas. And that's how I could see what some of these advertisements were because they would run in these industry newsletters, you know, industry magazines to try to recruit their own employees um, to head on over there if they could speak French, of course. So maybe we have time for one more question and then I can sign some books. Yes? Um, again, that that's really without outside of the scope. Um, you know, it, it, uh, it that's really outside the scope of my research. I didn't really focus on the male recruitment. I like to focus on you know. I think there's a lot written about the men who went to war, and you know what excited me about this topic was that most people never even knew that these women served in the U.S. Army Signal Corps, and. It, it, that's one of the things I really like to highlight in my writing. Not the stories that we're all already familiar with, but the stories of the people who don't yet have their own book, who aren't being taught in history class, or maybe are, but not to the extent that they should. The people who made contributions, but didn't get credit for it, or it was forgotten, or someone else claimed credit for their work, which happens a lot happen a lot in history, doesn't happen quite so much now, um, but it still goes on where, you know, the woman will do the work and the boss will claim the credit or something like that. Um, I like to write about the people who are maybe in the footnotes of someone else's story, if they make it into the narrative at all, rather than the people that we already, and, and of course there are lots of people that we don't know about, even in, you know, in those groups that are typically the focus. But I like to focus on the people that don't typically get the novel written about them. Um, so I didn't focus on the men going off to war. Sometimes you see them. There are men who went off to war in this book. But I focused on these women because I thought their story needed to be told. I thought they deserved to be remembered. and. It was outside the scope of this novel to talk about how men were recruited. So, sorry, I don't have a, a better answer for you for that one. Um, but what I will tell you is about speaking of research and what I did research. Um, I do have another book coming out next year, um, probably July. It hasn't been settled yet, but it's it's going to be called Canary Girls, and it's a book that I discovered. The idea came to me while I was researching Switchboard Soldiers. When my characters were in the UK, I thought, oh, 
And this is one of these things, oh, I didn't realize I would need to know this, but yeah, I actually need to know what was going on in the UK during this time while my characters are crossing the country and getting ready to sail for France. So while I was doing research into the UK so that I could describe it from my character's perspective, I learned about how the women there had been stepping up to fill all of these roles that they had traditionally been excluded from. And of course, they had been doing it for years before the US got involved. And I focused on, although there were women doing so many wonderful, extraordinary, difficult, dangerous things, I focused on women who went to work in the factories, in the arsenals and the munitions plants, um, to build the material that the, the armies needed. And I focused on one particular groups, group of these munitionettes, as they would call the munitions, women were, were, were munitions workers were called munitionettes. And I focused on one group of these women, and they were the women who worked with the yellow powder, as it was called, or TNT, which we all know is explosive and is very dangerous. But what they didn't know quite so well then and learned through the course of the war, it's also highly toxic to the people who were working with it. And the women who worked with this powder, many of them became very, very ill. And one of the consequences of the poisoning was that it was, was um, very intense jaundice and uh, other issues with internal organs, and so their skin would turn yellow. And nobody knew that, oh, this is a sign that they're really sick. They thought, oh, they're working with yellow powder, they're getting yellow skin, we get it. And advertisers jumped on it and advertised all kinds of creams to prevent this from happening to you. Ladies, keep your youth youthful blush. And you know, it was really because they were being poisoned by the chemicals. And um, so the women who had the yellow skin, they were given the nickname Canary Girls. And it was meant fondly. It was meant as a point of endearment. Um, but as the war went on, these women learned that this work is incredibly dangerous, and not only because of the danger of explosive, but because of this illness. And a lot of them had to leave. A lot of them left because they didn't want to expose themselves to the danger anymore. A lot of them left because they became too sick to work. But those who stayed, you would often hear them say, the lads risk their lives in their trenches. In the trenches, we risk our lives in the arsenals. So they knew it was dangerous, but they knew it was essential. So they kept doing it. But it's not all about you know, bombs and illness. These women found a lot of independence and camaraderie, and a lot of them decided that they really love to play football. And of course, here we call that soccer, you know, and just like, you know, when the men went off to fight, you know, professional soccer, football closed down. And so it gave women an opportunity to step onto the pitch as well. So that's also an important part of Canary Girls. And it focuses on one group of women at one arsenal who also have a pretty smashing football team. So that, that'll be coming out next year, and I hope you'll look for it. Well, thank you all so much for coming out uh, tonight to welcome me and my husband back to Wausau after we think approximately 15 years, but we'll have to look it up. Um, it's lovely to be with you. Um, thank you for supporting my work. Thank you for supporting your libraries and your local independent bookstores. They're all so important to the, you know, a healthy, thriving literary culture of a community. And I'm so glad that I got to be a part of that by being with you for the Central Wisconsin Book Festival. It's really my honor to be here. And I hope you enjoy the book. And thank you very much. Thank you.